and welcome to Building Perspective, the new World GBC series where I discuss the future of a global sustainable built environment with the leaders forging the way. Throughout the year, we'll be inviting built environment leaders to share their expertise, collaborate and discuss the top of mind sustainability challenges we face as a sector. We will hear their human stories behind their successes and how they are working to catalyze sustainable buildings for everyone everywhere. My name is Cristina Gamboa and I'm the CEO of the World Green Building Council. Today, I am thrilled to welcome David Godfrey. He is the founder of the World Green Building Council and I am very happy to be speaking to you, David. Welcome to this version of Building Perspectives. Thank you, Christine. It's so great to be here and uh, uh, have a nice chat with you about where we're at in the world and how we can accelerate. Thank you, David. Such a pleasure. You have been an inspirational leader for a green building or sustainable buildings movement for a decade now, or for decades, I must say, two decades. Could you share with us what drove you to sustainability in the built environment? and how your journey has evolved over the years, all the way to regenerative design. So let's start. Where did you start? Well, I started in Los Angeles where I grew up and uh, I don't really want to admit my age, but I remember uh, a decade where we had water shortages and en an energy crisis. And that energy crisis, the cars would line up and uh, Everyone was fearful for the first time for those precious resources, and it woke me up. A few years later, I went to college and became an engineer at Stanford University, and I was so lucky to study solar engineering. Uh, this was decades and decades uh, ago when solar was probably 10, 20 times more expensive. But we learned, hey, there's a sun out there. It can supply all the energy we need. It's precious. We can do things like heat up water in walls, trim walls, and it can radiate out. We could have passive solar where thick thermal mass absorbs the heat and radiates out at night. Um, also at Stanford, we had Paul Ehrlich who wrote about population crisis, one of the first in the world uh, many decades ago and ideas like carrying capacity of Earth to sustain the growing populace and that we didn't have enough and that resources were finite. And so these things w woke me up and were the early part of my journey. Uh, then I became a developer for 10 years in Washington, D.C. and learned the development and construction game, which is pivotal to then applying what I learned at school with how uh, business as usual worked in the real estate development field where we really did not value resources. We did not understand the sun or the wind or materials and even much deeper concepts we later uh, will talk about such as resilience. Uh, later on worked with hundreds of clients on projects, cities, states, countries, and then uh, the U.S. and World Green Building Councils were part of that equation. The journey continues, though. Yeah, and I would like to ask, David, when was that moment where you saw yourself as a green strategic advisor or consultant? When did that, that uh, powerful idea materialize? Well, after uh, we founded the U.S. GBC, I started in 92, day one. Uh, got it going in 93 with uh, Rick Fedrizzi and Mike Italiano. And then the World GBC idea came up in 98. But after the US GBC was going, uh, I started working as a strategic consultant in 95. So several years later. But it was a fun time because it was pre-green building rating systems in the US. And so that work was, how do you define green building? What is, uh, what is a green product? We, we had no idea really. But the first rating system, as you guys probably know, started in England with Briam, and I was able to study them. And later there was uh, an idea sketched out in Canada. Um, that one didn't work for some reasons. And then 
later on they adopted Lee. David, yeah. you have written also a lot about how to bring people together to form a movement. And you, you kicked us off 20 years ago. In 2022, World GPC is going to be 20 years old. Wow. So sorry, I'm giving a little bit out your age. But um, you, you've written how to bring people together as a movement. And I would like uh, for you to share with us the ingredients. We're talking about the ingredients also, right? What were the key ingredients in this journey from your perspective? Well, I thought a lot, especially with my third book uh, called Explosion Green. In the back of the book, it says it was our 20, a 20 year memoir of the green building movement. And I was thinking about why us? Mm -hmm. And I came out with a little framework of seven steps. And later I had the privilege of teaching what I called build move uh, twice at a local institution here. Uh, build move was how to create a movement and legacy. Um, and what are the seven steps? And I think the GBC movement invented this. So if you kind of study what worked, uh, step one I call PPM. We started with passion, purpose, and mission. And ours was to help Earth for transformation in the built environment. And then we created a broad vision. Now our vision is net zero. Today would be good. And then into the positive uh, element, a vision of health, as we discussed earlier, for the planet and for the people. But then how do you define health? A vision of equity, resilience, a vision of inclusion, a new area we just didn't think about enough. Even in our building materials, how are they made? Who makes them? Is, there, is it equitable? Uh, so what is your vision, step two? Three, to build this movement, you need everybody at the table. So it's who's your tribe? And we started with 13 sectors of the building industry at our table, the architects, the engineers, the contractors, the owners, the builders, the property management firm, the scientists, the utilities, the people who make products, the users, the cleaning company, the students. <laughs> but that tribe, this vision, this PPM, it works for any movement, any industry, uh, but you can't go it alone. No way. Get the people at your table, work together. Be transparent, be open source. Four, what's your blueprint? That's kind of the business plan, the strategy, but even more, we understand blueprints in the building industry, but you need those specifications. You need the what ifs, you need step one, two, and three. You need, what if we have a hurricane? What do you do? What if we have a flood? What if we have a fire? What if the grid goes down like Texas. Will you have water? Will you have sewer? Yeah. So the blueprint needs to go very broad. Uh, what if the ocean rises? What's going to happen? What if uh, the, the water sucked out of the soil because it's so hot and now we have food scarcity? Or the oceans are hot, acidic. Now we don't have as much fish. So we have to go far in the blueprint. Uh, what are your benchmarks? We're all doing our rating systems for buildings. I don't celebrate just one, I celebrate them all. Just have one, have it work. It's hard to develop one, start. Reiterate version one, version two, version three. Keep moving that top bar. Keep looking at results, not effort. The earth doesn't care really about effort. We need less CO2. Oh, we, need, that phrase. we need, yeah, we need more fresh water. We need those aquifers to fill up. We can work very hard, debate a lot, but the metrics are going to guide where we're at. You know, we just keep hitting record CO2 levels in PPM. I think we're at 417 right now. And 350 is at sustainable level, the scientists say, as you know. Um, many other benchmarks. What's a green professional? What's uh, the benchmark for a green product? Is there a red list? How do you define health? My wife looks at your DNA 
your saliva, your poop, your VO2 level for your oxygenation of your lungs, so many metrics. And now with genomics and genomics of buildings, we can go pretty far in personalizing benchmarks. She works in precision medicine where we are the N of one. So you can create all the metrics for your own body, but you can do it for your own building too, for your own carpet that you're making. And each vertical is doing that. Uh, benchmarks with wearables and sensor technology and the cloud and um, the, the, the processing capability is just going to go incredible. And we're just really starting as the computers and health and biomechanics and buildings and it all comes together. It's exciting time, actually. The sixth step of a movement is economics. As you know, without money, you're broke. And the economies are trillions and trillions move markets. And so we're seeing ESG, environment, social governance with bonds, ESG bond funds, ESG mutual funds, uh, ESG requirements, ESG corporate reporting. And it's just proliferating. It's, it's fabulous, really. A friend of mine helped create a group called SASB to work with the publicly traded corporations, the Sustainable Accounting Standards Board, to put materiality standards in corporate reporting. Uh, and that's impacting like $13 trillion of, uh, but that our sustainability is now in corporate reporting and in financial accounting. And that's huge. And now because it's in there, it's determining value and wealth. You see, it isn't valuable if it kills us. It isn't valuable if it makes the air bad. It isn't valuable if it depletes the water. It isn't valuable if it creates greater, bigger landfills. No, it's valuable when it's resilient, when it's positive. And so it's time to wake up and understand the real definition of wealth and value. And that's got to be embedded in economics, including tax credits that governments do and grants and funding and um, evaluation of companies, of buildings, of people. <laughs> yeah, and I was, I was also, uh, let's say, reflecting, even taking out perverse incentives that are in the economy to continue business, business as usual instead of uplifting, you no, know, a low carbon economy and better solutions. Absolutely, that's spot on. And the seventh step is how do you sustain the model? How do you sustain yourself? We're all green change agents. I appreciate your great work in building green building councils, rating tools, all these steps. We have to do it together. But as a change agent, as a visionary, you get tired. You're pushing, 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 pushing. You have a client, they don't want to go net zero. They don't know what net zero is. Is it risky? Is it slow? Is it expensive? You're always like a magician. <laughs> David, it's really clear in your books and many interviews you've done along the years. And, and I would like to go back to your passion for health and well-being at the human scale. But it also, it's, it's a fact, is that people in mindsets, as you also flag, need to shift, right, to truly address climate change. And, and we see a lot of announcements sometimes, but progress still is low. You, you, you were kind of saying, oh, and it's not happening, and we get a little bit, no, eh, out, of, out of sync with the passion. But I, I guess I would like to ask you to share with our audience, how do you see the intersection between people and the places they live at, they inhabit, and whether you've discovered a formula for truly sustainable living that is uplifting, that works for you, and that maybe can uh, get people on, on a journey with that connection to drive forward more their mission, their passion in, in this creation of, of a viable planet and future. Thanks. 
Well, when I think of people and places we inhabit, I start with self, maybe soul and heart, not ego. <laughs> but this is my temple, hopefully, and I want to make it healthy. Then as I, and I'm the atom of change, and I need to take individual responsibility for what I can contribute and control and have a commitment to make that uh, cause less harm and do good. Then that radiates out inside my home to my family, to the home we inhabit. How do I apply maximum good radiating out? Do I teach my kids about composting and solar and conservation and uh, materiality and, and doing good, creating legacy. And, and then my street, my community, my city, my state, my country, my, my world. It's all our home. The air doesn't know where our countries are. The rivers and, and aquifers don't care where the border is. <laughs> we share, and somehow we have to understand what I buy, what I drive, impacts you. And teach and educate a new culture, a new mindset, that this is our collective home. I'm going to put it in other terms and relate it to your experience in hiking and camping. He says, life is about, when you go out camping, leaving the place better than how you found it. And that applies to relationships, to doing any construction project, to delivering a consultancy. And that's why I really resound with what you did in Regenerative Adventures, the strategic consultancy you worked for many years. because. Actually, the term regeneration right now today, David, is, is again picking up, picking up because there's this sense of how do we make a, be more generous and help nature come back, right? After all this uh, devastation of, of the biodiversity crisis and also the big, huge impact that the built environment has in demanding resource, demanding resource, no circular, not, not enough uptake of circular economy solutions, no closed loops, just linear waste, waste, waste in many geographies of the world and we're just and as we as that happens now we're figuring out net zero which is uh, another step change higher in the agenda but could you share with us what was what was the the, the philosophy what do you think for today's uh challenges uh, would be like the lessons learned there's a lot of people interested in that in that regenerative term There's a whole field of study on what is re regenesis, what is regenerative. I learned a little bit about it uh, from Bill Reed. I, I think you interviewed him and worked with him, and he's part of a larger movement to define it. And they have their steps, uh, a nice framework for what is regenesis, what is regenerative, and it's worth studying. Um, and they come to a project, they come to a building, and before they start any design, they kind of map that place, uh, the culture and what was there and where's the wind and the sun and the water and the plants and the material and the CO2 uh, capability of what's growing there, uh, who live there. and really trying to understand that um, and regeneration starts with place what are you rebuilding towards how do you set those goals instead of i want you know a hundred thousand square meters i need four thousand people in there and i need you know computer center and six thousand cars parking space no start with the impact of place, of land, of uh, utilities and systems, um, energy budget you'll need to support that, and water budget, and how are you trying to get to net zero or, or it better into the positive? Because 
regeneration isn't net zero, it's positive. You have to restore that system to what it was before us humans um, made it worse. <laughs> David, and, and that takes me to, to, to the question I also had for you in terms of 2030 or yeah, by 2030, we know from the climate science, we should be at least having, having emissions in this decade to be in line with the Paris Agreement. Uh, how do you see this, this progressing? Because we, we're now saying you need to continue improving, you need to continue, continue measuring, and you, continue, you have to continue on the journey to, to challenge, to do even greater good, right? For, for people, for projects, for planet. How do you see the next years? Well, first, I want to thank all of you and Christina for your great work. There, there is much to celebrate of what we've created with 70 countries of GBCs, with, uh, I don't know, 20, 30 good rating systems, uh, with the World GBC Net Zero Building Commitment and its Race to Zero programs and uh, it all warms my heart, what you're doing and your spirit, your passion, your PPM. <laughs> However, we pause, do not confuse efforts with results. That's what my dad said. Um, he has a paperweight he gave us with that. And we have to accelerate because we've only moved the needle a little bit. But each year, we're growing in the PPMs, uh, not the PPM, well, the particles per million, that's a different PPM, um, you know, at 417. We got to get back down and half. But as we look at 2030, it's just nine years away. We're supposed to have. There's so many great things happening, like these ESG reporting, the corporate net zero commitments, beautiful flagship projects, advancing technologies, de declining prices of solar, um, expanding definitions of resiliency and islandability with microgrids. But we have to accelerate. We need to accelerate everything, like 10x. <laughs> And it has to be now because the numbers just aren't getting there. And we are in the built environment, which touches so much transportation, energy generation, products and materials, embodied carbon, the biggest area. The elephant in the room is, is scope three emissions, embodied carbon, that energy in the cement and the steel and those calculations. But we need to push further and farther. We need to advance the policies, the regulations, the codes, the rating systems, the manufacturing, the accounting for embodied carbon, the value of the building and the lease rental rates based on all that. And the celebration of great regeneration how do we do it? We have to push on every single front. But when you hear no, the client doesn't want net zero. They won't do a 23 ecosystem services accounting. You can't stop when you hear that no. If, if I quit at the first no, the 50th no, the 100th no, there would have been no GBC invention. <laughs> at US GBC first and even the world one. You know, people laughed at me. They're like, Green, are you crazy? I don't want to do that. Why do we need that? Everything's fine. You know, we have air filters. I gave 50 bucks to Sierra Club. Leave me alone. No, until we regenerate, until we can restore Earth and all its ecosystems for the future to sustain and beyond, and restore, we can't stop. And so that innovation, that spirit, that renewable flame in you has to create a smaller footprint 
And so we go back to the seventh step of the build move is you have to sustain so you can keep the good fight. So when the client says, no, I don't want that, it's too expensive. We don't have time for that. I don't have to do it. I meet code. Well, anything a little less than code is breaking the law. But earth needs greatness. Earth needs brilliance. Earth needs evolution back to consistency with the rules and laws of nature, which is what Christina said earlier, no waste. So you have to redouble your efforts. You have to get creative. I used to take the savings in energy and water early on in green building and use that annual financial savings, put a capitalization rate on it and say, now, well, we saved $100,000 a year. The cost of money is 5% or 4%, divide that by 4%. Now I want that chunk of money for solar, for, for renewable systems, which will then save more money. So it's, you got to take that budget and use it to maximize regen, regeneration, not um, this archaic form of beauty, which is, well, I want more marble and brass and this and that. No. Beauty is no waste. <laughs> Beauty is life sustaining. Beauty is what Christine also said when you go to the backpack, you leave it better than. So we just got it wrong. And get out of our minds, get out of our ego that thinks conquering and cultivating nature is success. No, living with zero footprint is success. Creating an economy, I call it a nega footprint economy, where value and wealth is, is growth in money, yes, but by growing and making more money, you allowed us to use less energy, less water, less waste, and higher health, and live younger. I like that. And of course, less carbon, less pollution, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and a safer tomorrow. David, it's been such a pleasure to have you in Building Perspectives. I am so, so happy to have reconnected with you today, have you on the program. All of what you've said is there's so many words of wisdom there. I know our audience is going to be following up with you and at World GBC. We're just so lucky to have had you as our founder. And we look forward to what you're going to be doing next. We love that you continue championing our cause and having World GBC on your shoulders. And I, I'm really grateful. And thank you so much for all you've said and shared with us today. Well, thank you, Christina, for your great work, your nurturing, your stewardship. And thank you all GBCs, all your staff, all your members, all your projects. Uh, you're really so important. You're, we're family, and we're here to help each other sustain, accelerate, and regenerate. And I can't thank you enough for what you do.